am Mimi Gerges. My guest has unique insight into the mind of an Islamic radical and how to defeat their murderous ideology. That's because he once was one. So we hated anyone who is not subjugated to this ideology as we understand it, who do not implement Sharia laws, who do not amputate the hands of thieves, who do not stone women to this. All these people were our enemies. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. When Tawfiq Hamid was in medical school in Cairo years ago, he was recruited into a radical Islamist group. But before he committed any acts of violence, his conscience was awakened. He's worked for the past 30 years on identifying and ending the cycle of indoctrination that leads to jihadism. His book is called Inside Jihad, where he explains what leads to radicalization, what mistakes we've made fighting it, and a strategy that can actually work. Tawfiq, welcome to the program. A pleasure to be with you. What is the root cause of jihadism? Let me be very clear on this point. Evidence, not opinion, is showing that the root cause is the radical Islamic ideology, the ideology. And the evidence is based on the following observation, that wherever you find terrorism, <laughs> radicalism in, in all its forms, jihadism, whatever you call it, you will see it coming from uh, people who follow this ideology. If it was poverty or like education or political circumstances, we should ask very basic question, why these circumstances did not affect non-Muslims who live under the same situation? For example, if the lack of democracy, for example, in certain parts of the world was the cause of the problem, why then it didn't affect the Christian minorities or the Baha'i minorities or other non-Muslim minorities there? So when you, when you put it in, 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 in a very clear manner, it's, it's clear the ideology is the cause. Let's go back to your story because growing up you weren't a particularly devout Muslim. Yeah. What changed for you when you got to college? Uh, actually, it was before college, the moment when I started to think about religion and God, and uh, it, it was a mix of different things. Initially, I thought about the beauty of the Creator through the DNA molecule. Then I was invited by people to join in debates with the Christians, and the concept of being selected and feeling that others chose you to, to represent them and speak was an encouragement toward this direction. And, in, in, and it was a wave of change in the whole Middle East from the Wahhabi Islam coming, what we call Petro-Islam, we can explain later, but the whole concept that the, the area as a whole, maybe, was moving in the world of Islamization. You see women starting to wear the hijab. You see people demanding Sharia laws. But what was causing that? It was basically, uh, we in many parts in the Middle East, and I'm talking here about Egypt at least, we started to say, look how Allah blessed the Saudis with oil and money and petrol because they follow this strict form of Islam or the Sharia style of Islam. So we in Egypt, started to follow and adopt this way of understanding that's that's very literal and rigid and replace our relatively moderate understanding of the religion so it was a wave of a change sweeping the whole Middle East they call it a Sahwal Islamiyah or Islamic revival and it was just one component of it moving with the stream there was also the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979. Absolutely. This gave us a clear evidence that we can change the situation on ground. We can remove the secular leaders like the Shah and replace them with a Sharia form of leadership. This was the role model. So the ideology came from the Wahhabis. Then through Iran, we have the model to follow. So you met Ayman al-Zawahri yes. in medical school. Absolutely. Who's now the leader of Al-Qaeda. Yes who's also a doctor. Yeah, sadly. Sadly, he's a doctor. He's supposed to save, he was supposed to save lives. And uh, you see how many lives he, he killed and ended because of this ideology. So you talk about three phases of indoctrination. Yeah. There's hatred, then suppression of conscience and desensitization or acceptance of violence. Yes. Where did you, before I ask you to explain those steps, where were you on that list of indoctrination? The three. I was exposed to the three of them. Uh, but the last one, I was not really the, like very strong on it. Like the hatred was, was started to develop. And then the suppression of my human conscience, justifying anything by just simply saying that Allah 
I ask it for it, so I cannot argue, okay? And then the third step, the desensitization to the violence, I, it was against my personality, to be honest with you. So I, I didn't, that may be the reason why I didn't continue, because this uh, third stage didn't work fully in, in my mind. So let's talk about the hatred, which is <laughs> the first step. Yeah. Who did you hate? Simply you go to any Friday prayer back then, and till now there are many mosques that are doing the same. You see many worshippers uh, following the Imam, and the Imam is cursing the Jews, the Christians, or Muslims who do not follow uh, Islam as we understand it. The West in general for promoting the freedoms of uh, women, for this was a major enemy for us, the freedom of women that you have here in the West. So we hated anyone and everyone who does not, so, who is not subjugated to this ideology as we understand it, who do not implement Sharia laws as we see in Taliban, for example, who do not amputate the hands of thieves, who do not stone women to this, all these people were our enemies altogether. So we hated them. The second step, suppression of conscience. How do you do that to another human being? How do you suppress their conscience? It's simply through two mechanisms. By one, number one, you com tell them that uh, which is a verse in the Quran that means no one can ask God about what he said, but uh, everyone else is can be asked about uh, what he is saying. So you can't argue with, with God, you can't discuss, you can't uh, uh, reason. You have to follow blindly. He's God. And so this concept made us unable to think. And uh, the, also the suppression of critical thinking makes you unable to, to analyze what is being said to you. The third is the fear of hell. The fear was so serious. Hell was not just a symbolic, was not a symbolic meaning. The torture tactics and techniques, we were always reminded with these torture techniques. So you feel that the moment you disobey this commandment, even though it's against your human conscience, you feel that the very moment you obey this, you will go to hell forever. You will be boiled in oil forever, for, for infinity of time. I'm serious about this. I'm serious about it. So the fear mechanism itself makes you unable to think outside this. You have to follow and you have to feel it is good. You are not even allowed to feel it is bad. Or to question it. Or question it. Mm. So how long did this process take? Because we always say, you know, radicalization doesn't happen overnight. How long did it take for you to go from, I'm a little interested in finding out more about religion to full-blown radical? It, it, it took me six months, around six months. Yeah. That, that's very fast, though. Very fast, yeah. Because you have the motivation, you read the books, and you have the ceremonies in mosques, ceremonies inside Jama'a Islamiya itself encouragement by the brothers around you. So once you are into it, you become blinded. It depends on the person, of course, but I was the last person to probably follow this because my father was an agnostic and a Marxist. So we were not really brought into this, the whole issue of religion yet. It worked on me. Your radicalization took place 30 years ago. Yes. Are young people still being radicalized the same way today? Yeah. I noticed they use the Jama'a Islamiyya and the radical groups, they use the same verses, the same t tactics, the same approach. Because if you think deeply, they are called Salafis or regressive people. They do not progress. They don't change. They use the same logic, the same verses, the same, everything the same. And that, that it works. It's, it's, they have many people, especially young people, and women who are scared, the fear mechanism is so powerful in the minds of these people. Believe but me. weren't there any counter arguments during that time? Where were the people that were saying, no, 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 this isn't how it is. They were isolated. You do not need to hate. You do not need to suppress they your were, conscience. Uh, they were either isolated or killed, like Farag Fouda, God bless his soul. He was against them. Literally, he wrote books against them. He was killed. Nagib Mahfouz, he just wrote a story that touches on some of their ideology. Some young man, 18 years old, he put a knife in his neck that affected him the rest of his life. So we were isolated, there was no internet. That's why I call it now the hope for e-reformation. Now I do whatever I like and no one can touch me. I am here in Washington and it reaches everywhere in the world. So that is the difference. During my time, we didn't have internet, so we were directly attacked if we spoke against them. So when you started to turn away from it, yeah. did 
Did that happen kind of suddenly for you? Did, was there one certain thing that it made you? It was initiated by a moment when I was invited <laughs> by the radical group Jamaa Islamiyah to help them in kidnapping a police officer and digging a grave for him beside the mosque of Jamaa and, and bury him alive. And this was maybe was too much for my human conscience to tolerate or accept or accept. So it's this was the beginning of the thinking process that they suppressed it. They suppressed my thinking. They said to me, if you started to think, you will become an infidel. Al fikru kufr. That's how they said it to me. And when this happened, I started to regain some of the words and verses that I learned actually from Jesus when I read the gospel with an attempt to criticize it one day. I read the verse that said, what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and loses his own soul? So I felt I'm losing my own soul if I continued with these people. Then what I was lucky to meet a friend of mine. He's still uh, there in Egypt. His name was Abdul Latif. And he uh, invited me to a different sect within Islam that was called the Quranic. They were not perfect, but they were less violent and barbaric than these groups. So it worked by a different mechanism and it's through a gradual process I changed it to what you see today. I want to ask you about the hijab. Yeah. Because you mentioned it before as in the Islamic revival, more and more women started wearing it. Yeah. Um, but how can something that women wear on their heads affect, and you say even, cause mm. terrorism? It is, in my view, how? The most important cause. You may, many people may be surprised why, but think about it. When you see your enemy always doing something before it achieves victory, then there is something here, okay? Give me one single example of a radical Islamic group when they controlled any part of the world, the number one thing they, they do was not the hijab. It is always number one. When you see... But they're very conservative and they uh, want women just, to cover just up. Just explain the whole phenomenon. We were not having the hijab in Egypt before the Islamic revival in the late 70s. Women, is, uh, Muslim women, and uh, were not wearing the hijab. Even Al-Azhar students themselves, the wives and daughters of Al-Azhar scholars in Egypt were not wearing the hijab. But when you see that terrorism phenomena never developed, never developed in any part of the world without prior proliferation of the hijab phenomena, then a basic scientific way of thinking should uh, create a correlation here. Why hijab has to proliferate first than terrorism? Why we don't see terrorism in places or com Islamic communities? But why? How can there be a link? How a link? Let me just add one thing. When the head of the Muslim Brotherhood spoke to Abdul Nasser, and Nasser, the former president of Egypt, was saying that he spent with him two hours, and his only request was one thing, the hijab. So you start to see why this is so crucial for them, why I was not asking in the J.I. Jama'a Islamiyah to do anything but promote hijab to women. This is number one, how it works, number one. It is a dress according to the Islamic law to, is to distinguish between slave girls and the free women. So free women was, allow, was allowed to wear the hijab, slaves were not permitted to wear it. So it is a discriminatory dress that uh, makes you feel superior to women who do not wear it. And my wife used to wear it and she can tell you how she felt when she started wearing it. So you start to feel superior. The feel of supremacy is like Nazism, is the beginning of all evil when you think about it. Number two, it, makes, it made us hate the societies and cultures and people who, do not, who allow women not to wear the hijab, have freedom of women. So we started to hate the West basically because women are exposed and they do not cover up. We started to hate them, so it created hatred, the very first step toward terrorism. Number three, the hijab phenomena creates a feeling of the Islamic ummah. You are here wearing the hijab, she is in Indonesia, the other in England, the other in France. So it bypasses the borders, no geographical borders, no countries anymore. I belong to the Muslim here, there and there to, through the ummah, not to my own country. And that is a big problem. Number four, and the last point here, is when you grow up as a child, you judge things typically by the deeds of the person. Like if you behaved in a good way with me, I will say Mimi is a good person. But when the hijab phenomena start to proliferate, we started to judge people not on their deeds, but how they dress. So if you are a Christian lady in Egypt, whatever you did to me, I would still hate you because you are not wearing the hijab. 
So it, it distorted the way of judgment within these young people, even judging the things around them. So this explained to us why hijab always is first and then terrorism second. And let me ask you this. There is some um, Western female politicians. Uh, when they travel in the Middle East or to Arab countries, they will put on a head covering yeah. as a sign of respect. This is ignorance. Why? Simply because we see it as a sign of subjugation to our Islamic law. And the more we feel you are subjugated, the more we justify attacks against you. Let me be very clear about one issue that probably I've never said before to anyone because it was too, it's too painful. Believe me, Mimi, when you behave in a good way with these people, with the radicals, they, we used to look to the people who behave, who forgive, for example, who do, as they are not human beings. Like us, human beings will react, will hate us, will swear at us, will react forcibly, will revenge. These people are not even human beings. And th this gives us the justification to even treat them as non-humans or subhumans, do whatever we, we do to them, hurt them, hurt their feeling, damage them. They are not seen by us. They were not seen by us as human beings. I know it is painful. I know it is very painful. But this is how we see things. And, and we used to see it as, as a radical. I'm not saying every Muslim thinks in this way. Many Muslims are good people and I appreciate it. But when you deal with radicals, you have to understand that what you do, like wearing the hijab to them, is not seen as a sign of respect. It's only seen as a sign that you are subjugated to us. But that's for the radicals. But, but the... the radicals are the problem. <laughs> and they are a problem. Don't you well, agree? Let me ask you this, because as you know, our politics here in this country has become extremely polarized. You have people who say um, anybody that says terrorism has anything to do with Islam is a bigot. It has absolutely nothing to do with the religion or the ideology. Then you have people on the other side saying mm. there's no such thing as a good Muslim. Anybody that says he's a Muslim means he's a potential terrorist. Mm. And, um, you know, nobody can really be a Muslim. Mm. Where, where, where do you fall in that? Both are wrong, in my view. Both are actually making things worse. Some people are ignoring the role of the ideology, while even in the Middle East, we call it the al-tatarruf al-Islami, which is Islamic radicalism. So we have no problem to call it in Arabic in the major journals, al-tatarruf al-Islami, Islamic radicalism. But when some Westerners say the same word here, oh, he is bad, he's saying the word Islami. These people are not living in reality. As I mentioned to you at the beginning, evidence is showing that the ideology is playing a role. It's not luck, it's not poverty, it's not lack of education, because if these factors were the cause, why the non-Muslims are not doing the same rate of suicide bombings as the Muslims, for example. Uh, and the others who say it's, there is no hope for moderate understanding of Islam are also aggravating the problem because they give no chance for any solution and people will say it's better to, ig to, to ignore the view of the ideology completely rather than to accept their views. I think there is a middle solution where you say the interpretations or the understanding of, of this uh, ideology or this ideology plays a role. Not every Muslim is a terrorist but certainly the ideology plays a role. It's like when you, people sm smoke cigarettes. Majority of people who smoke cigarettes do not develop lung cancer. Majority of them do not. Yet this does not change the fact that majority of people who are, or is of lung cancer are cigarette smokers. You see what I mean? So majority of Muslims who follow Islam are not terrorists, but this does not negate the fact that the Islamic ideology or Islamist ideology is behind the I want to ask you this because obviously a lot of people were surprised that Donald Trump won the election and getting into the mind of a jihadist. Yeah. What was their reaction? What do you think their reaction was? Scared to death. Because they don't know what he's going to do? No, they know. He will be tough. He will be realistic. He will treat them with, 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 with real force. He will not have a, he will not be a joke when when they do something against America they they I'm telling you this people the fear mechanism remember when I mentioned to you that made many of us just follow Allah because of fear so the same here when you lose fear with with some more of liberal style of uh, leadership when you don't have this fear the radicals have no deterrent for them 
they, they can do attacks because they know there is no reaction, no deterrent. But they know Donald Trump will be very tough, and I'm telling you, they would be scared to death. But do you trust Donald Trump to be smart in fighting Islamic radicalism? I trust one thing, that he has a business mindset, which simply means he wants to win. He is realistic. He will not create projects just, just to have names or titles. He will try to be realistic, and he wants to achieve something measurable. Uh, uh, I, I, I think in the previous administration, we didn't have any of these. That's why the phenomena spread. And also, he's, he's he wants to be efficient with money and spending. So he will not go to spend on unnecessarily thing, and he will try to direct the money to be effective and efficient. So I, I have uh, hopes and trust that this is going to happen. I hope so. So your plan to defeat radical Islamism includes psychological operations. Can you tell us about some of the components of that? I can tell you about the whole plan, okay? Because that's more that makes sense, okay? The whole plan is based on the, there are three segments here: the pre-radicals and radicals and the terrorists, okay? The plan works at each of these segments. With the, the pre-radicals, there is a form of theological reformation with reinterpretation of the religious text, which I started already and I have two million followers and on on my new interpretation for the Islamic text, Quran, special Quran. The second is changing the thinking process and the traits and the ways of thinking that leads to radicalism via what I can call cognitive psychology based educational models. You start to fight absolutism, judgmentalism, literarism, things that can change the mind and make it more radical. This is non-religious but worse at the level of the thinking process. The third is what I call shaking the foundations strategy which weaken the whole foundations of the belief of the radicals and their books and show the contradiction so how they are not authentic. So this is another game called shaking the foundations strategy. Then you go to the psychological operation or what I can call negative deterrence. This crucial to have negative deterrence for their psychology because without having- Is this a, a military operation then? No, it's psychological operation. Like I'll mm -hmm. give you an example. If I did an attack and I want to achieve something and then you prove to me with good campaigns that my attack actually produced the opposite then I will think twice before doing it again. For example, if I am doing an attack to praise or raise the banner of Islam in the world, let's imagine for a moment, then you show me in a strong way, strong manner, an effective way that my attack actually brought more insults to Islam and the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. So I am the cause of the insults now. The more I do attacks, the more will be insults to Islam. The moment my brain links doing an attack to more insult to Islam, this is a form of a negative deterrent. You see what I mean? So there are many things that can work in this way in their mind because they are not afraid of death. So don't tell me I will, if you said to them, we'll I just will kill, kill you. them. It's not working and it will not work. It's not like World War II when, when the leaders surrendered, when they were scared of death. These people want to die. So you have to find other ways. I cannot reveal everything. Of course, it has to be done in a very secretive manner. Do you think radical Islam can be completely defeated? Absolutely. Or do we just kind of make it less lethal, less common? Look, uh, the word defeated may be a relative term here, but I can say extremely weak and insignificant to a level that uh, it does not affect. So if you have one attack, for example, every 10 years here or there in the world, that's not compared to what we see today of uh, nearly attacks on daily basis, for example. And when I talk about radical Islam, I don't only talk about terrorism. I talk about the whole violence in the Muslim societies, believe me. I talk about stoning of women. I talk about underage marriage and female genital mutilation. I talk about in slavery and accepting slavery. So I, I, I believe the beginning of the hope for change is when I see the Islamic book shelves in the libraries having books that teaches against killing the apostates, against beating women, against slavery. But now, Sadly, they teach this, and that is the problem we have. We teach radicalism and complain of terrorism. This equation cannot continue forever. But like you this. said if you teach against these things, you're going to get killed by the radicals. No, now you don't. No, no, not anymore. Now with the internet, 
you can access the whole world and you have thousands of people now against the radicals speaking through the internet facebook youtubes now they can't find you if they if this makes them very frustrated by the way and makes them force it to think on the internet you you can't you can't kill me i'm now in a video what what can you do nothing so you have to think you have to answer so are you hopeful now I can't say, uh, I'm hopeful for one thing that the world started to see the, the threat more than before, but uh, I, I cannot be optimistic uh, until I see the leaders uh, taking the correct decisions and going to the right people to do this job. But as long as if you do the same thing again and again and expect different results, then that is the definition of insanity as Albert Einstein defined it. So I'm hopeful, but not very optimistic until I see evidence of the beginning of using the right people, putting them in the right position to lead this ideological war. Tofi, thanks so much for being on the program. My pleasure and honor, anytime. This has been the Mimi Gerges Show. You can see all of our programs on whut.org and YouTube. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and leave me your comments there. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next time. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.